fortune, I suppose. I have, I have not worked at sustaining it. It's just always been there. As a matter of fact, it seems to me that I have increased my ability to imagine things. I don't have to work at it. I never did really have to work at ideas. They simply floated into view, uh, like a balloon. There it was when I needed needed it. I didn't uh, ever have to suffer for it. What I suffered for was getting a job uh, in order to use the ability to imagine, I guess. It simply appeared in my lap. Um, I went to Harvard on scholarship with the intention of being an archaeologist or at least a history professor. And I rapidly lost enthusiasm for the archaeology when I realized it wasn't the romantic uh, drama that I thought it was. It was a lot of very hard work. I dropped that. I didn't immediately say, no, no, I'm going to be an actor. But I knew that my father was, and I was certainly always interested in going to the theater, and I began to play in amateur theaters, particularly at the Har in the Harvard Drama Workshop, which is a non-academic institution in Cambridge, uh, before the Th Loeb Theater was given to them. There was no, there were no academic theater studies at that time. I had to do something. It was easier to go back to school. And the closest school was the University of Iowa. And that happened to have a drama department, one of the first in America. So I uh, enrolled in that for a semester and then decided I would go into New York and look for work of some kind in the theater. Anyway, I became an actor because it was the only job I could easily get at that time. And I liked it. I wanted to be an actor. It wasn't, I wasn't against it. And I did consider myself an actor for quite a long time. And surprisingly, found, found out later in life that I had earned a pension from Actors Act Equity for uh, 10 or 15 years, fairly steady work at that time. And I had forgotten when I went on to be a designer more principally that I still had earned that pension and I'm living on it now, okay? Pirandello's Henry IV which I took over after the costume designer that I had hired to be costume designer for a classical repertory theater that I had started with three partners in Cambridge, Massachusetts. After he quit in the middle of the preparation for Pirandello's Henry IV. It was a big rush job, but I was fortunate that I had done history because I didn't have to re do much research. The play, part of the play is set in uh, Byzantium or Constantinople. I loved working on Star Trek, of course. As a musical comedy, I loved working on how to succeed in business without really trying. I loved working for Orson Welles and King Lear. 
And I think one of the most perfect jobs that I feel totally responsible for was uh, uh, the play of Daniel, a medieval 13th century opera produced for the Metropolitan Museum of Art. It was fascinating, interesting. And when the State Department finally took it on tour to show the world what American artists could do, it was very well received and only uh, criticized by the French critics when it played in Paris at Saint-Germain-de-Prés, when one of them said, this is impossible, it could not ever have been done by Americans, but it must have been done by at least uh, an Englishman and probably somebody French. Our inspiration comes to me from various sources. I may do a lot of research and know what the silhouette of a period or place is, but when it comes to a specific sketch, I very often get inspiration from a chair or a knife handle or a teapot that translates itself to me in terms of a dress or a suit or a coat or a jacket. I don't look for history only. The history is maybe the basic form, but the specific form for that character or that person can come from suddenly looking out the window and seeing a flower pot and making that costume refer to that flower pot. Designing for opera, one thing you learn very quickly is do not put anything close to my throat. The word diva applied to opera is very applicable. Uh, and designing for the theater of any kind requires a lot of diplomacy and a lot of pussyfooting about and expect to be ordered around and uh, kicked around in any part of the theater, but particularly on opera. I would rather work with the ballet because they know how to suffer. Uh, if the design is right, they wear it with no trouble, no, no matter how difficult it might be. And that comes from doing things like uh, the unicorn, the gorgon, and the manticore. Those are all monster costumes. Uh, ballerinas know how to schlep a train, let me tell you, uh, when many actresses resist and won't even, don't even want to be taught. I usually don't have to decide. I need one and I take the next one. Uh, sometimes I've been foolish enough to take more than one at a time. At one time in New York City, I had seven at once. And I had to hire a limousine and keep it on tap and seven assistants. And the limousines I needed because I had to be at workshops in Brooklyn in the morning and other workshops in the uh, opposite end of uh, Long Island in the afternoon and it was it, finally I had a nervous breakdown and I learned a little lesson there. But I still am greedy because I like to do what I have done. I was hired 
to do the second half, which included the Civil War. The first half included the Mexican War. I tried very hard to keep the second half attractive, amusing, but also quite authentic. So I did a lot of research. I happened to have a great deal in my own library. So I had a, uh, a complete edition of the Harper's Weekly. It was more than 12, 15 folio volumes, which contained a lot, not only a lot of news of the Civil War, but a lot of steel engravings of fashions so that we were able to go to the original patterns for the bodices and the sleeves of the Civil War ladies' dresses and so on. And there was a lot of original research on the varied uniforms used on both sides in the Civil War. A particular regiment was a bunch of scouts who were also snipers and they were, went lurking through the woods and shooting at the southerners from behind trees and bushes. And their uniforms, though, in the shape of the, the Union, the Civil War, were forest green in order to conceal them in the shadows of the forest. And we spent a lot of money making an entire company of these soldiers. However, I was also aghast, I like that phrase, I was quite aghast when I first saw that on film and being released, just discovered all the green uniforms had been turned back to gray-blue by the engineering department because nobody had told them that it was, there was going to be this anomaly in the middle of the war. Oh, watch out. If you do your research, do it, but don't uh, expect there not to be some accidents along the way. Star Trek itself by that time had a very lasting impact if Paramount was willing, willing to put the millions they did into the first movie. They didn't do that lightly. And uh, it's true that here it is 30 years later, uh, about, and uh, people are still forming groups and going to conventions in their thousands. So certainly what I did, and it's a relatively minor contribution in quantity, is still cared about is extraordinary, I think. But then Star Trek is extraordinary. I did four Star Trek movies. There are two distinct styles. The one style that was really set by Robert Wise, who wanted to keep things extremely quiet. He wanted to concentrate on the faces and didn't want distracting, distracting colors or images. So the color scheme on Star Trek, the motion picture was beige, gray, more gray, more beige, off-white, off-white, beige, beige, gray, more gray. And there were no distracting emblems. He asked me to design a lobby full of aliens, and so I did. I, we had several hundred different kinds of aliens who were supposed to walk across the lobby of the Starfleet at the beginning of the movie or in the middle or somewhere. And I was shocked when I saw the rushes that he photographed mainly the feet. And certainly I had not concentrated on the feet because normally you never see them in a movie. Uh, and he, he, at the last minute, had decided 
so that a lobby full of aliens looked more like a costume party than a lobby full of aliens. And that is true, I think, in many situations of that kind. I did another Congress of Aliens for a movie called The Last Starfighter. They did get on camera, and it almost looked like a costume party, but I had been wise enough to duplicate a lot of them, so there were four of them sitting together, or five, so it was not like a bunch of people who went out and rented an alien and come to a party. Uh, that was something I learned. And I would give that as advice still to people doing the future. Most of my time, particularly as a male costume designer, I, I have not had respect. I've had a lot of uh, contempt from my fellow workers in the theater who think that the costumes are just in the way. And uh, then a lot of praise from actors who feel that the costumes really help and that it's good to have a set on stage instead of three sticks, which I have done both. Today, there is a little more respect, particularly in films, for the work of costumers, costume designers and costumers. And it's not always been true. So if you want your ego to be stroked, be an actor. And I've done that. I once was called the best young classical actor in America by the New York Times. I don't know remember when or what play, but you, you can look it up. All I can say is be careful and love it. I remember the first day I saw Bob Fletcher, I was sitting at my desk at NBC wondering what was going to happen, and there he walked in with a very chic look. He had on a safari jacket, a beige safari jacket, I remember it well, and uh, I fell in love. <laughs> it was my first meeting with somebody that was as tolerant, as talented, as adorable. As stubborn. <laughs> I don't know, as, and, oh, talk about stubborn. Whoa. Um, yes. He uh, is of the iron blood. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it was a great joy working for him. Always has been. It's still a great joy working with him, because now he's sketching for me. It's but you're fabulous. The, you're the boss now. <laughs> I used to be the boss. But it took, and, took a long time for me to get to be the boss, I'll tell you that. Well, but you did it very, very so solidly. What was, what was that year? What year was that that we met? Yeah, it was either 69 or 70. Oh. about Greg Garrison. Oh yeah, oh Lord. He was the producer of the Dean Martin Show and many other sub subsidiaries that we worked on for him. And he always said he could see nipples on these girls and we had so many falsies on them that, that you, there's no way you could see any nipples. But he was determined it was what he wanted to see. It was very funny. He was amazing. Well, it, the, the faith he had in me, it was always, I couldn't believe it. I never believed it when he said, this is the best designer I've ever had, you know, in his very gruff way. Uh, I suppose I tried my best because I was afraid of him. <laughs> A lot of people were. <laughs> yeah, well, that's the system he worked on, yeah. you know, contrary to Dean. Who was the most, Dean Martin was just peaches uh, and cream. Yeah. And he was not a drunk. No, he wasn't. 
He was yeah. absolutely... Every time he, I mentioned him working for him, somebody asked me, was he really a drunk? No! <laughs> he would come into work at 11 in the morning with his entourage. He'd lay down on his couch in his dressing room. He'd l watch the monitor. We would go through the entire show one, one time. He would look at the monitor. He would get up, put on his tuxedo, go outside and do it and knew where to go and don't tell me, you can't be drunk and learn that. But a lot of the... He's amazing. He was really amazing. The guest, and he was afraid, really, to make petty small talk with people. That's yeah. a reason he wouldn't, re one of the reasons he wouldn't rehearse with guest stars sometimes who were, who were offended because of it. But the, oh, but he, he was just shy. You must. been my lifelong good friend, the love of my life actually, really, <laughs> and, uh, and my mentor and my teacher. He's taught me everything that I could possibly know. Well, while I was learning it. <laughs> yeah, well, we, we learned a lot together, I guess. Yes, I... But anyway, we're, it's, a, it's still a wonderful relationship. We've spent a lot of good times together. Yep. Well, I hope we have a little more. That's... Oh, okay. I'm, she wants me to argue. Oh. <laughs> <laughs>